Today we want to continue our discussion from last last video. We're talking about pension plans, one of my favorite topics. It's a really fun asset allocation balance sheet immunization problem because the risks are pretty exaggerated. So a little bit of work, you can eliminate a lot of work, a lot of risk, as we saw with the Robert Arnott article. It doesn't take a lot to reduce a tremendous amount of work. And then I'm tying that to my blog on borrowing to invest. So we want to make sure we're going to re-review things we did last class. This is a tough topic for some students, but it's oh, it's such a tremendously wonderful topic because it breaks all this material you've had in all your previous finance classes and brings it together to say, do we really believe this? Does a really does a real world really make decisions like this? And we see with pension plans, they don't. So why are pension plans so in contrast, in contradiction to the theories that you've been taught in your finance classes? Is it that the pension plans are wrong or is there something wrong with the theories? So we'll talk that. Now, I'm going to try to convince you one way or the other. You have to make up your own mind. You'll definitely see that I believe the theories. I think pension plans are wrong and they should change how they allocate. You can see Robert Arnott thinks the pension plans are wrong, but he doesn't think they should radically change what they're doing. He, he thinks they just make tweaks. I think they should radically change what they're doing and look more like life insurers. Arnott wants this in between where you balance the career risks that most people are focused on with the asset liability risk. I'm more on the life insurance side. You should invest based on your liabilities and that should drive everything. So. You're getting three extremes. You're getting the pension plans that says forget all the theories and just put everything in stocks or most of the money in stocks and just hope the stock market does well. If R not, this is balance those three things, the peer risk, the asset risk, and ALM risk. Then you have the suite approach, which is very consistent with what life insurers do that says you have a liability, you're responsible for it, you have a fiduciary responsibility, invest entirely based on that liability and forget about career risk and peer risk and asset risk focus entirely on ALM risk. So I'm giving you the, the three, the two extremes and are not in the middle. And after doing that, we'll talk a little bit about life insurance. We can't do too much with life insurance in this class. I talk a little bit more about it in my life insurance class. We spent a few classes talking about it there, but even there, it's such an advanced, such a complex topic. It's really hard even at, in graduate school to get into it too much. It's just, it's just a really tough life insurance is really one of the most difficult asset liability, interest rate risk management uh, scenarios out there because of all the optionality in life insurance products. And then the last one I want to talk about is endowments. I've worked a lot with endowments in my career and endowments a lot like pension plans, I think make decisions that create a lot of risk, not just on interest rate risks, probably more so, on price risks, so endowments will be a good link between interest rate risk and price risk. And so, uh, so we're, I'm setting this up for some, I think, great discussions you can have in interviews and also whet your appetite that this industry is, I think, is not doing things well. So you walk, you're walking into an industry where I think there's a tremendous value that you can add if you really and truly are paying attention or in thinking about what you believe about risk and risk management. So we've already covered the first 10 slides of this. We asked the question, if a firm can borrow at 3% and invest in stocks making 8%, will borrowing say a billion dollars and doing that, would that increase the value of the firm? And I wanted you to, I wanted you to tie this to a pension plan. So instead of the firm going out and borrowing money for the public markets, they're essentially borrowing money from their employees. Instead of paying their employees a billion dollars a day, they're instead going to keep that billion dollars and invest it for the employees and pay them back in the future with the pension plan. And so here's, here's the issues that we've talked about. The first thing we said is when you borrow, what does that do to the firm? So first of all, the borrowing itself impacts the firm and then what the firm does with that borrowed money. So remember, there's two things there, and this is really very, very important to understanding how you're going, how you're going to answer this question. There's two parts. There's actual borrowing money. I go out and borrow a billion dollars. What is that debt doing to me as an entity? 
And then after I borrow the billion dollars, I'm then going to turn around and invest it in something. What does what I invest in impact? So we got two pieces of this equation. What does capital asset pricing model say? And, and I, 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 I'm, I have this statement here. I, I don't like the way I have this worded. I would probably change it. Um, but this is Miller Modigliani. If you have not had Miller Modigliani, and it's their names are spelled just like they sound, Miller, M-I-L-L-E-R, and Modigliani. I don't know if I can spell it off the top of my head, but M-O-D, Modig, M-O-D-I-G-L, a I N O I, but if you if you talk Miller and Mod M O D, you'll they'll come up. And their theory about the impact of debt on the value of a firm. And what they argue is before taxes, before bankruptcy costs, if a firm borrows money, their cost of capital will not change. I know it says it rises. I'll explain why I say it rises here. I, I kind of got the cart before the horse your horse here, but in a normal corporation, if they borrow money, that borrowing money, their borrowing money has a cheaper cost. The cost of debt is less than cost of equity, so you increase the weight of debt, and this number is smaller. Why doesn't the WAC come down? Well, because as you increase the weight of debt, even though this part of the equation is bringing your cost of capital down, more debt causes your KE to rise. Financial leverage costs, causes cost, cost of equity capital to rise. Therefore, there's no impact on the WAC. So why did I say that WAC rises, all right? So make sure you have this in your notes. If someone's, another professor saw this, they say, wait, this is wrong. This is not correct. Before taxes and before bankruptcy costs, WAC does not change when a firm takes on more financial leverage. It stays exactly the same, has no impact on the value of the firm, except for what? And my argument is when your borrowing involves a pension plan, that absolutely does increase the whack of the firm. Why? Because when the borrowing for pension plans, um, it's, it's exaggerated. Why? Because the liability is extremely long duration and the liability has a cost of living adjustment. So the liability, this is not normal corporate debt. They're not going out and they're borrowing three to five year debt. They're borrowing from their employees and they're going to pay them back over 30, 40, 50, 60 years. It's very, very long duration, which means it's extremely sensitive to interest rates. So that increases the, the beta of the firm. Not only that, but there's a cost of living adjustment. So then inflation risk, another systematic risk. So very sensitive to interest rates, very sensitive to inflation. So when you set up a pension plan for your employees, the very fact that you have a pension plan causes the beta to increase more dramatically than just regular borrowing and that's the reason why I say the firm's cost of capital goes up. Not only that but on the investing side most firms borrow funds and stick it in the stocks which is a pure beta play. So they're not expanding operations. Remember when a firm borrows and invests in the firm a lot of that that investment in the firm is unsystematic risk. It's company specific so a lot of that risk just disappears, doesn't really impact. The only impact on the beta is the fact that they're borrowing and they have that fixed cost of, of interest expense. But they're not increasing, they're not changing the beta because they're investing in higher beta things. But when you borrow and invest in the stock market, the borrowing greatly increases your beta because it's very long duration and it's tied to, to inflation. And you're investing it in the stock market, which is a pure beta play. So Everything you're doing with the pension plan is greatly increasing your cost of capital. So I hope this makes sense. We may have to do this when we do our our one our smaller group discussions and make sure everybody understands this point. You should have a lot of notes written around here. This is one thing I want to see. While my notes are not really clearly written here, I should have done a better job of linking this slide with the next slide. I want to make sure you understand it. So make sure it's clear in your notes. Talk to your peers. Some students say, where else can I go to, to get this information? And it's just, it, there's not good places out there. You're kind of stuck with me in my discussions and Robert Arnott. And I'm going deeper than you can probably find out there. I, I, I don't know anyone else that's going to this level. Pension plans were my thing. So I thought a lot about this. There's a few articles I found that did discuss something similar to this, but extremely technical articles would probably cause more damage than good to try to get through 
all of that. So it, it's a tough topic, no question. But if you can let it sink in, boy, you have a great understanding of the theories of finance. And so why do I think, so again, why is a pension plan a significant beta increaser for a firm? And it's because the liabilities are extremely interested in, 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 sensitive to interest rates. And then I talk on taxes. I'm ignoring taxes, but if we could get into the tax side, I think it actually strengthens my argument. And then I get into what they invest in. And this is an extremely important link too. When a firm invests in a project, what, what does that do to the value of the firm? So let's say a firm borrows and they invest in building new stores. If the net present value of those new stores is $100 million, then borrowing and investing in those new stores will increase the value of the firm by $100 million. That's the theory you got in your accounting classes, your management accounting classes, and you talked about net present value, cost of capital, cost benefit analysis, that if the net present value is positive, then the value of the firm goes up by the net present value. So the question is, if you buy stocks in a company, what is the net present value of that investment in the stock portfolio? And my argument here, and this is where I'm like blowing your mind, but this is this is the theory you're taught undergraduate. So you either, if you don't agree with what I'm saying here, then you need to go back and figure out what of the theories that you were taught that you disagree with. But if you put a billion dollars in the U.S. stock market, the present value of that investment is zero. The expected value is zero. Why? because stocks are efficiently priced. You're getting exactly the return to cover your risk. No more and no less. That's the same thing with cost benefit analysis you did for companies. If you have a low risk project, then it's discount rates 4%. If the net present value is zero, then that means it's giving you exactly the 4% you need. If you invest in a more risky project, say an 8% risk project, and you the project expected to make 8%, so its net present value is zero, the value of the firm doesn't go up. You might say, well, it made 8%, the other made 4 That's true, but the one that made 4% was lower risk, so only needed 4%. And that's all the stockholders required. So if you made 4% on a project that had 4% risk, then the net present value is zero. If you make 8% on a project whose risk is 8%, then your, your net present value is zero, and the value of the firm does not go up. I know that's a, that's a tough concept. I think we don't teach it in a way students can actually take it and say, well, what does this really mean? So this is a chance to say, what does this stuff really, really mean? If you're, if you're having a tough, tough time with this, boy, give me a call, especially in the morning when I'm on the bike. You'll make my, my three-hour bike ride feel like a 30-minute bike ride because I love talking about this stuff. So you'll actually make me very happy if you call and say, okay, professor, let me, let me restate what you said in class and you tell me if I'm getting this right. That would be a wonderful thing for you to do to help help with this extremely important concept in finance. So, so the appropriate discount rate, if you're going to invest in the stock market, your appropriate discount rate is cost of equity capital using a beta of one. That's the right discount rate to use for an investment in the stock market. And that's not talking about the whack of the firm. I'm talking about the discount rate for this particular project. The, the appropriate discount rate for this particular project is the cost of capital of equity capital for the overall stock market, not the beta of the company, but the beta of the overall stock market. You're not investing in the company, you're investing in the stock market. So you don't use the WAC because you're not, you're not doing a normal investment of the firm. You're investing in the stock market itself. Well, all that unsystematic and systematic risk material you learn doesn't apply here. Now, if you don't remember that, then do a internet search on the capital asset pricing model and refresh your, yourself with beta and systematic risk, unsystematic risk. I'm not going to recover that in this class. You should have already had that. So there's two things I'm telling you you should already know. Miller Modigliani and the capital asset pricing model. Those are th two things as a finance major or an actual science major you should know extremely well your senior year in college. You should know it off the top of your head and you could write 30, 40, 50 pages on those two theories. So if you're not remembering them, go out and do a search Wikipedia. I know we're not supposed to say Wikipedia, but I've, I've actually seen they do quite an exceptional job 
whoever is writing for Wikipedia, for Miller Modigliani, and for the capital asset pricing model, they're doing an ex excellent job. So this is a good chance. Go back, review those theories if you've forgotten them. They're, they're pretty basic material that you should have had probably four or five times already undergraduate. And then I go one step far further and really blow your mind is that since most pension plans don't invest actually in the stock market, they invest in actively managed stock portfolios, which historically 80, 90% of the time have actually underperformed the market. Then I would say for most, and I know this with absolute high confidence because I used to manage pension plans. I used to talk to a lot of our peers. And I remember sending my staff to a conference. We had already indexed our stock portfolio. We said, forget this active management. We are going to focus in on asset liability management. So the little bit of stocks we do have, we're just going to be indexed. We're not going to try to beat the market. And my staff goes to these conferences and they, they go, Ron, we come back from these conferences. Everyone, everyone at our dinner table is complaining about how all of their active managers are just doing horribly. If they have 10 managers, seven of them are doing badly and three are doing well. And then the next year, seven are still doing badly, including the three that were doing well the year before and now three. And it's just this constant battle of we can't find managers that can consistently beat the market. So, and and if you want more research on this, there's a guy named Charles Ellis. I think it's E-L-L-I-S, but I can't remember. But Charles Ellis, Jack Bogle, B-O-G-L-E, Jack Bogle. There's, there's some famous, famous researchers. I think Charles Ellis is probably the best that has shown that active management just overwhelmingly underperforms. So that... What most pension plans are doing is investing in the stock market and getting a negative net present value, which means the actual stock allocation is actually destroying value for the firm, ignoring the fact that the pension plan itself is greatly increasing the whack. So bottom line, when a firm offers a pension plan, it increases a financial leverage in an extreme way. So it actually increases whack, unlike what Miller Modigliani would say, it actually increases whack because the financial leverage is so extreme. And then what they do with those funds that they keep from their employees, they invest in the stock market in active management that has a net present value of zero or actually negative. Negative. So firms that offer pension plans and invest all of that money in the stock market or 60, 70 percent in the stock market are actually destroying the value of the firm. Don't you wish I could find that guy from AT&T and have him and me do a big debate in front of the class. I think that would be a blast. I would I would do that. It might be embarrassing. Maybe there's things he would say I hadn't thought of. I'm giving you the academic side. He might give a practitioner side. Obviously, the argument he would make is how well the stock market has done. But remember, that doesn't matter. If the stock market can make 10%. That's great. But your required return was 10%. So it's your stockholders got exactly what they needed because you increased their risk. You gave them much more risk. And when you see the stock market drop like it did in 2008 or like it did in 2020, they need that higher return to cover for the huge risk that you're putting on them. So here's the next part. And this is extremely important to the question as well. Is let's go deeper dive into those pension liabilities. I've talked about two things, the fact that they're extremely long duration, so very sensitive to interest rates, and they have a cost of living adjustment, but there's a little bit more I wanna talk about there. There's four risk, specific risks that pension liabilities have. The R not article only talks about interest rate risk. It's the only, I think he, he mentions a little bit inflation risk, but he just mentions those two. We've already talked about these two. Let's add two more on top of that. A pension plan also has longevity risk. And that's the risk that these plan participants live much longer than assumed. I just read an economics article about Japan and why Japanese are living so long. Uh, they have a lady who just made it to 118 years old. It's just, or 116, I can't remember, but up there in the teens, 100 and teens. And they have a large number, 85, I think they said 85,000 people that are over the age of 100. And I was listening carefully because I'm 57, so I want to know what are the Japanese doing that's enabling them to live so long. And it was, it was an interesting discussion, but longevity is going up. Now, it's interesting in the U.S. Our life expectancy has actually dropped here recently. 
because of what's going with the opioid crisis. More people and, and the increase, unfortunately, very sad in, in suicide rates, opioid use. So our pharmaceuticals are killing us with these painkillers and painkiller addiction. And, and I know a tragic story at, at one, one of the people I know whose son died because of uh, a painkiller addiction. And all of that is having a huge impact on longevity risk. So our life expectancy in the US, U.S. has actually, for the first time in ever, probably ever, has actually dropped. Maybe maybe there's time during war and other times where it's actually, actually dropped. We know that COVID-19 has had an impact on life expectancy. So longevity risk here recently has actually come down slightly. But over the long term, we expect that science will keep finding ways that make us live longer. So uh, that's pretty important. When the 65-year retirement age was decided decades ago, life expectancy wasn't 65 years old. So now here we are decades later, and life expectancy is 85 years, and people are still retiring at 65. So pension plans have a much bigger uh, uh, task to take care of. Same thing with Social Security. Social Security has that same issue. Social Security has longevity risk, has inflation risk, has interest rate risk. The second risk of pension plans is anti-selection risk. And what this, this is a risk I'm definitely going to notice with my USA pension plan. When I turned 62 or 65, I haven't decided yet. They changed the plan slightly. I don't know how they changed it. It used to be you retired at 62 because there was no difference in the payout between 62 and 65, but that's actually changed now, so I'll have to make a decision. But when I turn 62 or 65, I'll probably spend a few thousand dollars to have a very thorough health review, get hooked up to the treadmill and all that kind of stuff, and ask my doctor, as far as you can tell, what's my life expectancy? Am I healthier than average or less healthy? If I'm very, very healthy, I'm there's a good chance I might actually take the USA pension plan as a payout because it's a really good pension plan. It has a cost of living adjustment. So if I'm very healthy, I'll stay in the plan and I'll take my monthly income. If I'm very sick, if it looks like, you know, I could die in the next five years, I'll take the lump sum. And so what happens with this anti-selection is healthy people stay in the plan and take the payouts and unhealthy people take the lump sum. And that is a huge risk. Now, what USA is doing now, I thought it was very interesting. They've radically changed their plan. I'm kind of glad I'm not there anymore because I think I would have stressed out with what they're doing. I'm not sure they're making good decisions on this. I'm not involved in the detailed discussions, but it'd be interesting. If I can find the actuary, um, the actuary, I was good friends with the actuaries I worked with there, and he's a good friend with my little brother. I'm hoping maybe I can get a chance to sit down with him and go through everything they talked about once COVID's over. I'm really curious what they're doing there, but they're actually trying to get more and more people to take the lump sum. They're actually sweetening the pot for the lump sum. So there's a good chance I'll take the lump sum even if I'm healthy. So I think what USA decided is, you know what, we'll actually lose millions of dollars today in order to eliminate that anti-selection risk, but that's huge. Now, Social Security does not have an anti-selection risk. If if you die, you just lose your Social Security. You don't have the you don't have the ability to take a lump sum out. But that's that's Social Security doesn't have that risk. But Social Security has the other three. Inflation risk is again a lot of pension plans. Most pension plans do have a cost of living adjustment. And then interest rate risk. When interest rates are low, your discount rate for all those future payouts, your discount rate falls. And because the duration is so long, as we saw with the Arnott article, the liability will increase dramatically, very sensitive to interest rates. Now, think about this as far as your own personal life. For you, you have three of these risks as well. You have longevity risk. You're, you're saving for your retirement you have the risk that you might live, like the people in Japan, you might live to 115, 120. And if your entire retirement plan is based on you dying by 90, then you're going to be having a really tough time those last 30 years if Social Security is not enough to take care of you. And that's when buying a having a pension plan is really good because it keeps paying out no matter when you die. So longevity risk is an issue. So there are some products 
that do address longevity risk. I talk about them in my life insurance class. So there are products you could purchase to handle that risk. You don't have anti-selection risk for you personally. So um, you have a decision. Do you annuitize something so that you you solve that longevity risk or do you just keep it in your investment portfolio so if you die early all those assets are available to your to your heirs so you, you you're kind of playing between these two if you do something to eliminate longevity longevity risk you're essentially reducing what you can leave for your heirs so you're kind of playing between these two risks but you don't have a true anti-selection risk it's more of how do you invest your money how do you handle longevity risk you definitely have inflation risk and inflation takes off it's going to make retirement much more expensive and you definitely have interest rate risk when interest rates are low stock and bond returns are much lower that means you have to save a whole lot more money because you're making less returns you have to save a whole lot more more money to meet those liabilities in the future so very very important list right here longevity risk this is this is something i remember i saw this at a conference and I thought it was interesting that this, the speaker at the conference was trying to emphasize how much different longevity is today versus, say, 50 or 100 years ago. And this was an interesting thing he did. Whistler is a famous paint, painting. Whistler was going to do a painting. And I think the story is the lady that was going to sit for the painting, something happened. She got sick or some, some crisis came up. And so Whistler's mother sat in. And Whistler's mother was 67 years old. And the speaker compared Whistler's mother at 67 to Sophia Loren at 77, just to show the difference. And I've noticed this. I, I watched a lot of TV shows from the 50s, very interesting programs. And I'm shocked when they give the age of some of these people. They say, this person is 58, and oh, they look like they're in their 70s. So you can just notice it. You go back to the to TV shows in the 70s. It's amazing. And I, I realize actors and actresses may do things today that are somewhat artificial to make themselves look younger than they really are that Whistler's mother probably couldn't do. I, will, I don't know anything about Sophia Loren and what she did. I, I found another picture I thought was interesting, a picture of Raquel Welch at 74. Compare that to Whistler's mother at 67. And yeah, we're living longer and you, you really notice it. We're eating better. We're exercising better. I realize obesity is an issue in the U.S., but smoking has dropped dramatically. Uh, drinking actually come down. Your generation, the millennials, don't drink as much as my generation. Your generation is healthier. Uh, food is an issue. Obviously, corn, corn starts or corn syrups and sugars, uh, fast foods. There's things we're doing. You know, there's, so there's a contrast, uh, but our work life is much safer Cars are much safer. Uh, there's there's a lot of things that have caused us our life a living expect, life expectancy to increase up into the 80s. And if you if you don't get COVID and you survive, or if you get it and survive it, if you're not using opioid, opioids or drugs, if you're not smoking, if you're not drinking, if you do exercise, if you are eating right, your life expectancy is much longer than the average for the U.S. because you have an advantage over Whistler's mother what we know today versus what they knew back then. So think about these, these risks and what they mean for you personally. But also, if you work for a firm that has a pension plan like USAA, even though they don't offer it to their new employees, they still have a large pension plan from previous employees, how would you manage these four risks? Because they're huge. So a little bit more on interest rate risk, a little bit about how gap accounting handles this. Gap accounting for private pension plans, they use the current yield of an investment grade corporate bond with the same duration as the pension liability. That's a huge change. The discount rate used to be the expected return on assets. And when you had 70% in stocks and you're expecting stocks to make 9, 10%, they give you a really high discount rate. So major liability looked really small. When they switched to this discount rate, that caused the liability to, to mushroom. And a lot of plans, that's why they decided to get out of their pension plans, because it just made them look a lot more expensive. Public pension plans still use expected return on assets. So public pension plans are still grossly overstated in their, their liabilities. 
And no one wants to change those rules because public, public pension plans are so ridiculously underfunded, even with an exaggerated discount rate. If we went to the correct discount rate, it would just, it would be an absolute disaster. And I do think we have a disaster. It's just we're using the wrong discount rate. So we're essentially lying about it. We say we have this serious problem with public pension plans when the truth is we have a disaster that is going to, going to be almost impossible to fix. But as long as we lie and use the wrong discount rate, we won't know about that risk. I think the true discount rate should be a long-term treasury yield. And the reason I say that is corporate bonds have a higher rate or a higher interest rate than treasuries because corporate bonds can default. They can go bankrupt. And so you're getting paid for that risk. Well, pension plans don't go bankrupt. The employees, if the firm goes bankrupt, the employees are still there. You still owe them the money. So there isn't credit risk with the pension plan. There you have longevity risk. They may actually live longer. So there's no reason to have a risk premium in your discount rate for pension plans. The risk-free rate makes the most sense. And there are websites that actually show the impact of using treasury yields on these public pension plans. And it is, they're scary numbers. I'll, I'll try to show you those numbers. So all three of these are closely tied to interest rates, whether you're using investment grade corporates, even expect return on assets, even though there's stocks in there, stock expected returns tend to be lower and interest rates are low. And treasuries are also obviously tied. So pension plans have very long durations. So when rates fall, the liability increases significantly. When rates rise, the pension liability falls. But you remember, we saw this in Arnott, it's not symmetrical. The liability rises much more when interest rates fall, then it falls when interest rates rises. So we said that means pension liabilities have significant positive convexity. We're going to see that same thing with life insurance liabilities. So I showed you this chart. We've already seen this chart. Just remember this. Hopefully some of you have already gone out and see if you can replicate it. And I hope you've tried that. If you try to replicate it, you couldn't get it to work, then set up a Zoom session with me and I'll walk you through it. And I'll help you, help you be able to do that. And I say that not because just to understand pension liabilities, but just to make sure you understand the basics of finance. This is a pretty basic thing. And if somehow you missed that in some of your classes or just forgot it, don't graduate without making sure you can produce this page because it's extremely important that you understand this. It's pretty basic finance. So these are this is a huge risk. It's a risk your generation is going to have to deal with. And it's not just in the U.S. Japan has a huge public pension issue that is bankrupting that country and you see it in other countries. You've seen the, the U.S. Postal Service that before its pension plan, it's probably barely making money. But when you bring its pension plan and health plan in, the, the U.S. Postal Service is losing just billions of dollars all because of these retirement plans. They're, they're a serious concern that your generation is going to have to deal with because my generation just keeps kicking the can down the road. We just keep hoping something will fix it. In fact, our biggest hope is that uh, the economy will just suddenly start growing real fast and that would fix a lot of those problems. But our economy hasn't been growing fast. It's been growing actually at a fairly, fairly anemic rate. So it's, it's an issue your generation will have to deal with. It's going to be a generational issue. So my generation will vote and we will vote against your generation anytime you try to change our, our employment benefits and our government benefits. So it's going to be a generational warfare. It's going to be intense, especially when the U.S. Is, debt is so huge and it's huge before taking consideration how underfunded Social Security and Medicare are. It's going to be a huge problem. It just shows you when people don't manage risk honestly and thoroughly and using the right assumptions, huge, huge risk, just mushroom over time. And then suddenly they become so huge that it becomes a major, major crisis for the entire economy. So we talked about how pension plans reduce the value of the firm for two reasons. The liability is extremely high beta. So that increases the cost of capital of the firm. And what firms invest in in the stock market actually is a negative net present value so that kills the value. 
Pension liabilities are unique, unlike any other type of borrowing a firm would do, making an extremely difficult risk and really makes the firm much, much riskier. So what if instead of investing in the stock market, what if firms with pension plans followed balance sheet immunization? I already told you the story. I, I started thinking about this after talking to the life insurance actuaries. So I say this a lot. You need to have a diverse background in your finance career. I, I, I put something on Facebook not too long ago about Chuck Yeager and why he was so famous. And Chuck Yeager was a pilot, a test pilot, but he was also a mechanic. So he didn't just know how to fly the plane. He also knew how the plane actually functioned. He knew how the engine worked. He knew all the components. So when something unusual happened on the plane, he better than any other pilot knew how to respond. He had solutions that no one else would have thought of. And that's how you need to be as an actuary or as a finance major. You need to learn the guts of the business. And so that's what I, I was very fortunate at USA that I interacted a lot with actuaries from the life insurance side actuaries from the property and casualty side, and then the PhDs in math from the marketing side at USAA, all very different skills, but very quantitative, very extremely technical people. And so my interactions with the life insurance actuaries radically changed my ideas about how a pension plan should invest. And I came up with this idea, hey, we should be immunizing our balance sheet. It was at a time where our CEO said, we're going to shut down USA's pension plan because of the new gap rules. I was trying to convince them not to do that. I'll tell you what later why I think firms should have pension plans. I lost that argument, but at least with the pension plan we had left, we did immunize it. We started by looking at the liabilities, and we made that our number one. Remember, Arnott said peer risk, asset risk, then ALM risk. We said, no, forget peer risk, forget asset risk. Let's start with asset liabilities. Just figure out the liabilities, and let's invest to immunize that. We talk about the four liability risk. Interest rate risk is the one we can address the most straightforwardly. It's hard for us to do anything about longevity risk or um, adverse selection risk. So those we're kind of stuck with. We have to look at them. I might talk a little bit later about some ideas I had on longevity risk, but they, nothing really worked well. There are hedges for inflation risk, but they tend to be extremely expensive right now. Or the hedges are very complex and very illiquid. There's an idea I'll talk about a little bit later about one thing I, I would love to try now using the corporate bond market and inflation-linked treasuries to try to come up with essentially an inflation-linked corporate bond if we create it synthetically. But I, I don't know if it's possible. I, I wish I could go out and talk to my old peers at Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley to see if they could create something like that. But inflation risk is a little tough. There are hedges, but they don't work very well in the market. So interest rate risk was the one risk that I could address. Very straightforward. Hedging, hedging interest rate risk, your portfolio needs to be significantly in long-term bonds. So we went from 70% stocks to 75% bonds. The capital markets don't really provide bonds that are long enough in duration. So we use swaps. We use interest rate swaps. The first swap contract I did was for our pension plan. It's a really cool transaction. Um, so we actually use that to hedge almost 100% of our interest rate risk. Now the reason we did not go 100% the reason we left a little bit of interest rate risk was that inflation risk. So if you think about it, we're most concerned when interest rates fall. That's when our pension liability rises a bunch. Usually when interest rates fall, inflation's also very low. And so I thought, okay, when interest rates are low, part of that risk is offset because our inflation is low. And so that gives us some, some cover. So interest rates fall, so yeah, our, our Liability rise, but inflation is low, so our liability won't rise as much. So I can have a little bit of exposure to rates falling. When rates rise, what I did is rates tend to rise when inflation's a problem. So when rates rise, it's true our liability will drop, but it won't drop as much as expected because our inflation risk is going to be higher. So I actually we shorted it. We weren't quite exact. We didn't do exactly dollar duration gap analysis. But essentially what we did is we found what our dollar gap analysis duration was 
adjusting for some cost of living in, uh, uh, exposure to try to get our interest rate risk down to zero after adjusting some for inflation risk. It's a fairly complex concept, but you, you can see what we were doing, what we we're trying to do. We probably still had some inflation risk, but at least we got rid of some of the inflation risk, and we think we got rid of all of the interest rate risk. So why did we do that? And this was my argument. Federal law required me as an employee personally to only invest the assets of that pension plan solely. And that word solely is really important. It doesn't say mainly or primarily. It said solely in the best interest of the plan participants. I could not invest the pension assets in order to help the corporation. I even tried that with my lawyer. The argument I said is, well, can I put a higher allocation to stocks and argue that the stock market does well, it reduces the cost of the pension plan, so it makes it much more likely that we'll offer a pension plan, and that would be in the best interest of the participants. And the lawyer said, no, that argument doesn't work. You've got to look at the existing plan participants, the interest that they have vested, and you've got to invest for them. You can't talk about future, what you might do in the future. And so that argument works. So essentially, legally, Balance seed immunization is what I was bound to do, right? So the very nature of the pension plan argues that the pension liability should be hedged by the plan assets. Why? Because if I stick 70% in stocks and the stock market takes off, there's no benefit to the plan participants. Their, their uh, benefit, the pension that they will receive is exactly the same. They receive the exact same benefit whether stock market makes 12% or 7%. There's no difference to them. We don't like say, wow, the stock market's doing well, let's sweeten our pension plan and give our... No, 100% of that increased stock return goes back to the plan sponsor, the firm. So a heavy allocation of stock saddles... What it might do is saddle taxpayers with the bills. So this is one of those things, stock market does well, the, the corporation benefits well, the participants get nothing, stock markets crash, the firm is harmed, they go out of business, the pension plan now gets turned over to the U.S. stock, stock payers, uh, taxpayers, the U.S. taxpayers through the PBGC. The PBGC is the benefit, 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 guarantee corporation. They take over pension plans when the corporate sponsor goes out of business. So essentially, firms like AT&T that put 70% of their money in the stock market, they're essentially no benefit to their participants, and they're rolling the dice for this taxpayer. And as we saw earlier, they're increasing the risk of the firm, so they're not even doing anything for the stockholders. They're actually harming the stockholders too. There's no one benefiting from this except for that employee that's investing in the stock market. Why? Because of career risk because of peer risk. It all gets back to how we're compensated. So I believe firms that place a significant amount of their pension plan in stocks are violating their fiduciary responsibility. Just like a life insurance company putting a bunch of money in the stock market because they think stocks will do better than bonds, they would be shut down by the regulators. That would be way too risky. I think it's the exact same analysis with pension plans. In the best interest of the pension plan participants is to maximize the probability that the plan will be able to pay its commitments. Balance sheet immunization does exactly that. Now, so let's now ask, well, if a firm does that, what does that do to the value of the firm? So we say the participants are better off, taxpayers are better off. Obviously, taxpayers don't benefit if a firm invests in the stock market and, and the stock market does well. All that goes back to the firm. So what does balance sheet immunization do to the stockholders? So this is an incredibly important slide. I got this from my first boss in finance. I love this chart. He said this. I had him used to have him speak to the risk management class, but he was a little over our heads. He was getting too in-depth into the industry that he, he worked in, which is utilities, which is a very complicated industry. But he started his talk off with this, and I would, boy, I would, I would print this out and carry it in your wallet, I think. This is extremely important. Um, or put it in your pocket or attach it to your phone or take a picture of it and have it as a photo on your phone. Put it, you know, wherever you, whatever you carry around with you. I don't know if y'all carry wallets and purses anymore. Your generation tends to be pretty streamlined with your phones. 
Um, maybe you need to have a file on your phone of photos related to finance theories that you always want to keep right in front of you. And this is one of those. There are two ways to increase the value of the firm. One is to do positive net present value projects. That's increase the firm's free cash flow. All right, that's the first thing you do. And that's what most people think of first. How, I'm going to, how am I going to increase the value of this firm? I'm going to increase its free cash flow by doing this, this cost benefit, doing this capital project that has a positive net present value. But the second way you can increase the value of the firm is by reducing its risk, reducing its cost of capital. If you can reduce its cost of capital without harming the free cash flow, you've increased the value of the firm. And what my first boss in finance says is that is one of the easiest ways for a lot of firms to increase their value, but a lot of firms don't even think about that. So buying investments in the pension plans to hedge the interest rate risk of the liability, what does it do? What does it do to the net present value? Has no impact. Remember the net present value investing in stocks is zero or maybe slightly negative. The net present value of investing in these bonds, if you immunize the portfolio, it's also zero because markets are effective. So whether you invest in stocks or immunize, there's no impact on the free cash flow of the firm. You're simply buying zero net present value projects. But what's the impact on the risk? Immunizing your, your, plan, your, your firm's pension plan will reduce the cost of capital because you've eliminated the risk of that liability. So the net present value of the investment, whether it's stocks or bonds, is zero, but there's tremendous reduction in risk and tremendous, tremendous reduction in the cost of capital. So balance sheet immunization not only protects the participants, protects stockholders, um, taxpayers, excuse me, I keep saying stockholders for taxpayers, maybe we are stockholders of the United States, but protects participants, protects taxpayers, and increases the value of stockholders. So the guy from AT&T, I think he's actually destroying value at AT&T with his approach. So why is he doing that? He had the same finance classes I did. He had the same theories I did. I'm, I would guess he understands all of this. He seemed like a really smart guy, and he's not the only one. Uh, USA immunized its pension plan, and, and in 2008, out of the top 1,000 pension plans in the United States, 999 of them saw their, their pension surplus go from a surplus to a deficit in 2008. There's only one pension plan of the top 1,000 in the United States who actually saw their surplus rise, and that was USAA's. So out of the top 1,000, I can't talk beyond the 1,000. I bet the rest of them are probably doing what the other 999 were doing. Out of the top 1,000 pension plans, USA was the only one to immunize its pension liabilities. The gentleman who took my place at USAA, he came from AIG. He, he's, he is a life actuary in training. So he definitely, he wanted to immunize AIG's pension plan. And the board would not let him do it. And their argument was no one else is doing this. It gets back to that career risk. Remember career risk. Career risk was a reason they decided not to do it. So that's a huge impact. So why is everyone doing this? I think a nurse is a big part of it. So theory argues against it, and yet most firms put a great deal in the stocks. Why is it? Well, first of all, it's the historical accounting. Historical accounting allow firms to take the volatility of the pension plan and spread it out over many, many years. So you didn't notice it in gap accounting, now, whether or not the stock investors noticed it, that's a good question. There's been some studies to see if the stock market reacted to pension plans selling off, even though gap accounting didn't, didn't show it. And I have seen some papers that, that say firms with pension plans are materially overvalued because the stock market is not valuing those pension plans correctly. But then the second thing that caused this was the high stock returns in the 90s. A lot of pension plans, a lot, a lot of firms with pension plans actually had their pension plans as, as profit centers. So as the stock market went up, that reduced the cost of their pension plan. And boy, they were, they were saying their pension plan was making money. It really wasn't. Their discount rate was incorrect. The impact on the firm was negative because they, were not, they weren't accounting for it correctly. Gap accounting was not the right measure. But from the gap accounting that they were using at the time, 
their pension plans looked like they were profit centers. And that was, that was the argument people made. The accounting has changed. They no longer smoothed out the accounting. It's now just as volatile as, as the, what I've been showing here. So, so this is a major risk management error in finance. It's worked well in the past, so it must be good. That's not a good argument, especially with these what we call tell events, these extreme events. They don't happen very often. So something, you know, if you live in, you live in a floodplain and it hasn't flooded in the last 20 years, to say, hey, there's no risk here because it hasn't flooded in 20 years, that is bad risk management. The fact that something has not happened does not mean it will, will not happen. So uh, we'll, we'll get into that when we talk about um, Taleb, Nisam Taleb, and his, his theory, uh, this theory of black swans. Black swans are actually the most important thing in the world, but they don't happen very often, so a lot of people ignore them. And then a 2008 happens, a 2020 happens, and suddenly they're like, wow, I never saw that coming. And, and Taylor would say, you should have seen that coming. We have seen stuff like that in the past. We should have expected it to happen again, but you assumed it would never happen just because it has, hasn't happened in the last 20 years. That's interesting with pension plans because if you were to go back and look in the 70s, pension plans would have been a disaster in the 70s because stock markets had a horrible decade and inflation was really high. The two things that would just destroy pension plans. But firms, they didn't notice it. The accounting didn't really handle it. Pension plans weren't that large. And then in the 80s and 90s, suddenly pension plans were making them all this money because the stock markets were doing well. So we really, it's not like Nothing's gone wrong the last 50 years, so everything's fine. It really wasn't that far back. You just had to go back to the 70s. So firms, all they looked at was the 80s and 90s. Everything looked great. So that's a terrible way to manage risk. So if with that argument, I should argue that the firm should invest all of its resources in the one stock because that one stock, maybe it's Amazon, Maybe it's Apple. That one stock has done great the last 10 years. So the best risk management technique is we should go out and borrow $10 billion and put all of that into Apple stock. And that will greatly increase the value of the firm. It's not a good argument from a risk standpoint. Now, some argue, you know, we immunized USA's pension plan and it did great in 2008. Instead of losing its surplus, we had a $300 million surplus at the beginning of 2008. By the end of 2008, we actually had a $900 million surplus. So our surplus actually tripled when the other 999 pension plans actually saw their surplus go from positive to negative. But people could argue, yeah, Ron, but since then, the stock market's up a bunch. You would have gotten all that back. And that's the argument people make is, let's look at returns and ignore risk. If we just look at returns, things are better off. That is a violation of basic finance. So if you're, if you're in that argument with AT&T, it doesn't matter because stock, stocks have done well, so we are better being there. If you want to make that argument, you're making an argument of finance ignoring risk. And I don't think that's a good argument, but you can try it and see how that does in your career and let me know 20 years later. So we've seen the demise of the U.S. pension plan. Why? Because, uh, I argue, because of the way they've been managed versus the way they should have been managed. If pension plans had been managed the way life insurance companies were managed, we would not have seen, I would argue, we would not have seen the demise of the pension plan. Most firms have discontinued their pension plans because of, I say two bear markets, we've actually had three now, count 2020, but 2020 was a deep drop and a quick re rebound. So it's hard to say that one, since it happened within the same year, pension plans won't notice it that much. People don't really notice pension plans except for right at the end of the year. Um, you can just see here's pension plans and you see they're dropping, dropping, dropping and people are going to 401k plans which is what you'll probably have. If you work at USAA, they have a very rich 401k plan but you will not get a pension plan. This is private retirement. There's a lot of public plans. States and cities and teachers and firemen, they all have pension plans still and they're all terribly, these are public pension plans, they're terribly underfunded. Uh, they're still offered to local and state employees. These plans have high allocations to stocks. 
with that belief that stocks always win in the long run. And the accounting rules for public pension plans have not changed the way they have for, um, for gap accounting. And so they get to grossly understate the risk. Several states are nearing insolvency because of their underfunded pension plans. Uh, there's the website right there. I forgot that I had given it. I'll have to let's let's go and see what we can find there. So here is this website, and it shows you so on a market basis and actual basis. The market basis, I believe, the way they do this, you can look at it. Um, the discount rate's the key. So the market basis, I think the discount rate they're here they're doing here is using the treasury as a discount rate, which I think is the correct way. Here they're using the discount rate based on the, the accounting standards, which is grossly overstated. But here's the pension debt. This is California, public employees pension system. It's a trillion dollar liability. You call it here. They even call it debt. Isn't that interesting? They don't call it a liability. So they're borrowing to invest. When you use their exaggerated discount rate, look how much it drops. One trillion dollars down to three hundred twenty-five. This is their deficit. This is the difference between their assets and their liability. And California has a trillion dollars per household. That's eighty-one thousand dollars. How in the world are you going to handle a public, a government debt where you need $81,000 from each of your, of your citizens? And California is probably losing population right now, especially wealthier people are leaving. Now, they say it's only $27,000. That's a pretty hefty deficit itself. So it's, it's pretty amazing. You might want to go to this website and just see. Uh, 2018 is as far back as we can go. If you go back to 2008, no telling what what it might give you. With 2008, um, yeah, I don't. It's I'm not sure exactly what all this website's showing you. It looks like it doesn't go back quite that far. But interesting website. They have a section that says what did the numbers mean. So if you want to get into it more, boy, it'd be an interesting discussion to get into. Some of you might want to actually be on the benefit side of investing, and there's still those jobs there. There are firms out there, and most of them now are focused on 401k plans, but there are jobs for actuaries and for invest, investment professionals working with these retirement plans, and there's a lot that you can do there. If you're interested in those kind of jobs, these are the type of websites you should go to and just see, see what's going on. So I say more than 75, so you can see now it's more than $80,000. One trillion dollars underfunded. Um, so I'm a strong believer in pension plans for employees. They're an excellent retirement tool. They provide retirement income for people who are very undisciplined. I know there's a paternalism to this, but a good friend of mine working at USA, she helped me with the ins with my property and casualty insurance. I helped her with the retirement. She had a 401k plan, but she had she had rated it so many times. She should have had hundreds of thousands of dollars in that 401k plan. She only had like 40 something thousand or something. I can't remember how much, but a small number. But her pension plan was worth about $300,000. That was the one thing that kept it between her pension plan and her social security. She was going to have a decent retirement. She, we, she'd be better than probably 70, 80 percent of the American of Americans just because she had a pension plan. What would have happened to that lady if all she had had was her 401k? She kept rating, even though it would have been a much richer 401k, so instead of 40,000, maybe she would have 80,000. But just knowing her and how she could not resist, and she had, she had a challenging son that she had to take money out to help him out, uh, it really caused problems. So discipline is an issue. People just, they, they do... They do their 401k, but a lot of them will borrow against it and take money out of it. When they change jobs, they just take the money out. So a pension plan is it's a paternalistic way of keeping employees from making stupid decisions. So because of that, because we don't have these pension plans, we have a looming crisis for workers in their 50s and 60s that are just not ready. Most do not have a pension plan other than Social Security. 
They have, they have maybe 20, 30,000 in their 401k plan, which will barely fund a year of retirement. So this crisis could be catastrophic. Most workers will simply work longer or do partial retirement and be able to do a part-time job, which can help. So it's sad to see the demise of these plans. And the only reason we have demise, I believe, is because they were poorly managed, poor risk management. If they've been managed like life insurance companies manage them, so when I talk about my solution, my solution is be really clear here. Don't get confused with what I'm saying about options. We get into price risk. For pension plans, my solution is go 100% balance sheet immunization. So because their employers can't manage this risk and the employees can't manage the risk, they don't have the discipline, people are going to be working well into their 70s. So... I'm going to stop it there. We didn't get as far today as I wanted to, but I love this topic. I could go to another seven hours on this topic, but we'll stop there. And what I want to do next time is talk about what does this mean for you as an individual? You have a pension plan, which is your retirement that you need to be building. Which of these theories about risk that apply to corporations will also apply to you as an individual and we'll talk about this I'll talk about it more in my life insurance class when we talk about human capital and its implications for investing but I'll bring those in so you can see that everything we talked about here for corporations and pension plans also apply to you as an individual